I'll call you brothers and sisters, even though I don't know you all, um, because that's what we are in God's family. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing your spirit and your love and your memories and your support uh, at this time for uh, Linda and the family in celebration of Orland's life and the impact that he had on the world. On the world, and if you take a quick look around, that impact is pretty significant. Um, my name is Bishop Vasileros. I will be presiding and conducting today and um, want to thank Sister Judy Putterbaugh and Sister Terry Figgins for helping us with the music. We're going to begin with an opening hymn, number 292, Oh My Father, and the invocation will be held or given by Steve Tanner.
our dear Father in heaven. We come together this day and ask for a special blessing upon us all at this time that we might all be able to be comforted by thy spirit. That as we go through our, our loss and our sorrow, that we might be touched and comforted. To know that Orland has passed to thee. That he has completed all that thou has asked him to do. Again, Father, we humbly ask this, that we might truly know that thou art there and comforting him as he has been taken from us, that we might be able to remember those wonderful times as we celebrate his life. Father, we say these things in the name of thy son, and our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll proceed with uh, hearing a life sketch by Sister Valerie Hinkle, and that will be followed by a musical presentation by Terry Figgins, Consider the Lilies. Although Orland Shelby was born March 24th, 1943, and was the fourth child of Naoma and Borny Tilby. He grew up in a home his father built behind the Boise Depot. As a young boy, he and his friends would put coins on the train tracks to see if they would be flattened when the trains came by. At the age of seven, his father bought him an accordion and signed him up for private lessons at a local music store. His dad sat with him while he practiced as much as he could, and that was a special time for the two of them. Once Orland started school, he didn't see much of his dad other than lesson time. Borny was a most important motion picture operator. And by the time Orlin was home from school, his dad was already at the theater working. His father struggled with diabetes and cancer. Borny passed away at the age of 48 when Orlin was only 10. After that, Orlin lost interest in playing the accordion because his dad was no longer there to share that time with him. When he was 12 years old, he and his mother traveled to Canada for his sister Starlene's temple wedding in the Karsten Temple. They had to travel by bus, and because the bus was so crowded, he had to sit on a plank between the seats the entire way. That was a very long and difficult trip for him. During those years after his father died, he spent a lot of time at his oldest sister's home, Zeta, and was like a big brother to Sherry and Sharla, her daughters. When he was about 14 years old, his mother took him to hear an accordion band and introduced him to Leon Burt, the music instructor. This re-sparked his interest in music and he returned to playing the accordion. 
Mr. Bird kind of became like an adoptive father to him over the years. And as they worked together, Orlin became an accomplished accordion player. He was then hired to teach lessons at the studio and also put together two accordion bands. He really enjoyed that time of his life. In 1961, Sherry, his niece, introduced him to mom when she was a senior at Boise High School. They dated the entire year and then mom and dad were married three months after mom graduated. Mom was 18 and dad was 19. Orlin continued to teach accordion lessons, but also attended Boise Junior College, which is now Boise State. He studied in the music field to further his education. He was also serving in the Air National Guard from the time he was 18 till he was 22. So that was a very busy time in his life. Nine months after mom and dad were married, their first child was born, and that was me. This was the weekend of a big accordion festival at the music store. Myron Florin, the accordion player on the Lawrence Walk Show, came to Boise as a guest artist. There was a luncheon for teachers and their spouses at a nice hotel downtown. Mom and dad got to sit across the table from for Mr. Foreign. And by the way, mom was in labor at the time. Mr. Foreign was asking them what they would name the baby if it was a girl. He was told Valerie Ann. He said, you should name her Accordion. <laughs> That afternoon, mom and dad had to leave to go to the hospital and missed his concert that night. However, at the concert, Florin announced that one of the teachers was having a baby and he played a special lullaby and dedicated it to me. In April, 1965, when mom and dad were expecting Brian, their second child, they were able to be sealed in the Idaho Falls Temple. I was also sealed to them when I was 22 months old. Mom says that was a wonderful experience for our little family. The following year, mom and dad moved to Eureka, California with an offer for a new experience in the music field. Everything from teaching, teaching to broadening his skills in playing the piano and organ. He continued to teach, but also worked in sales, organ repair, and many other areas of music. He was also called as ward organist there and shared his talents playing the organ in church from then on. While in California, mom and dad were blessed with four more children, Shauna, Eugene, Carla, and Preston. Orlin also served as an early morning seminary teacher and loved this experience. He, he taught for about two years. After 12 years in Eureka, mom and dad decided to move back to Boise be, to be closer to family. And dad, he chose something entirely different than the music field. He began working for Simplex Time Recorder. They are a worldwide security company where he installed security systems in government buildings, hospitals, and schools. He just wanted a change from being in the music field. He enjoyed this adventure for the next 20 years until he retired. They were blessed with two more children, Todd, Tanya and Todd, and their family was complete, a total of four girls and four boys. Shortly after he retired, they moved to Meridian, where they have been in the Tully Park Ward for the past 15 years. Our family has grown, and now they have 24 grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, and two more on the way. 
Since coming to Meridian, Dad has served as the organist. He served in the scouting program, high priest group leader on the stake high council, and served as an ordinance worker in the Boise Temple. He also served a three-year mission from home as a family history consultant over the phone and online helping other members with their family history. Shortly after his mission in 2017, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. He ref refused aggressive treatment and surgery because of watching his older sisters and what they had to endure with traditional treatment. He moved forward with a quest to find alternative methods for treating the cancer with diet and life changes. He fought this battle for almost five years with prayers and a strong will to live. He was cared for by his mom, by mom, <laughs> cared for by mom and many family members. We are so proud of him, a loving husband and a father, the service he gave to others and the influence that he was in our lives. He will be greatly missed by all. If I can get through it, I want to share one more thing. One night, fairly late, um, after recently after I had helped dad off of his bed and down the hall. And then we got him back to bed and tucked in. These words came to me and I wanted to share it with you. When I was only three, my feet on top of his, dad would dance with me. My arms in his hands, mine wrapped around his knees, dad would dance with me. Many sunrise, sunsets, lessons learned, no regrets. Dad would dance with me. My wedding day, hard to find the words to say. Dad, he danced with me. Wedded twice, a death and a new life. Dad, he danced with me. His wisdom of the years, we shared with some tears. Dad, he danced with me. Now near the end, his life nearly spent. Dad, please dance with me. His arms wrapped around me to lift him to stand. Dad, please dance with me. Though your body is weak, this time, lean on me. Dad, please dance with me. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Yeah. 
his eye. <clears throat> Consider the sheep of his fold, how they follow where he leads. Though the paths may wind across the mountains, he knows the meadows where they feed. He clothes the lilies of the field. He feeds the birds in the sky. And he will feed those who trust him and guide them with his eye. Consider the sweet, tender children who must suffer on this earth. The pain of all of them he carried from the day of his birth. He clothed the lilies of the field. He leads the lambs in his fold. And he will lead those who trust him and make their hearts as gold. He clothed the lilies of the field. He leads the lambs in his fold and he trust him and make their hearts as gold. Thank you to Valerie and Terry. Um, we'll proceed next with uh, hearing from Brother Ron Putterbaugh. And then we will hear a really special musical presentation, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, which is a recording from Orlin himself. And uh, then I'll make some remarks and we'll go from there. Be difficult. <clears throat> I've known Orlin for many years. Uh, he a very special friend to uh, Judy and I. Uh, Valerie, I promise you that one day you will dance with him again. <clears throat> a few months ago, when uh, Linda called me and asked me to speak. I did a lot of soul searching, wondering uh, why he had to suffer. And as I thought about that, my thoughts uh, turned to the Savior and all that he had to suffer. And it was necessary for him to suffer, it says in the scriptures, so that he might uh, succor us in our infirmities. You see, even though he was perfect and he became a God in premortality, he never had experienced what it was like to have a body. 
to know infirmities and temptations and all those things that we have to go through. And so it became necessary for him to do what he did. But because of what he did, we don't have to suffer because we can turn to him. We have two choices when we suffer. We can turn inward to the natural man, natural woman, and cry out, why me? What have I done to deserve this? And we can cry out and murmur and complain. But if we do that, then all that he has suffered for us has been in vain. But if we turn inward to the spirit within us and that light of Christ, which is in all of us, then that will pull us up to him. And as we do that, then he will grant us his grace. The ability to endure all things well. And I know that that's what Orland was experiencing. He was being drawn up. And because of that, he learned the second thing. And that was the ability to be drawn out, to be able to draw his family to him through his suffering so that you might succor him and lift him as he lifted you. One of the things we are told, we are to mourn with those who mourn, comfort those who stand in need of comfort. And you did that for Orland. His suffering drew you together as a family and it drew us together as a ward. And therefore, his suffering is not in vain. And so I promise you, as we go forward and remember him and all that he went through and all that he went through for us. And if we, in our time of pain and sorrow, if we will look inward to the spirit and allow it to draw us up to him, he will grant us his grace and we'll be able to endure all things well. And we will then learn those lessons that we were sent here to learn. And that was how, with how to succor each other in our infirmities, to show compassion and mercy. I know that if Orlan were standing here, his words to you would be, God be with you to uphold you, to guide and direct you, to lift you up, to carry you along, to bless you with his love, mercy, grace, compassion, until we meet again. In the name of he who suffered that we might not suffer, even Jesus who is the Christ. Amen.
What a powerful testimony. I'm, I'm a little as struggling for what to say next because I wasn't expecting that, what I just heard. Not only was he unbelievably talented, uh, but the, the power that he conveyed through his music of his faith and of his testimony and his witness of the savior is, uh, it's not something I've heard much. That's the second time in the last hour that we've heard music shared in a really pure heartfelt way. And what, what a privilege to be here and to witness his final testimony to his children, his grandchildren, his friends, his family, loved ones, that the savior lives. I don't think there's any doubt in that testimony. There is no room for wondering whether Orlin Tilby believed that Jesus Christ lives or that he is our, his redeemer, his savior, or that the atonement is real, or that we flawed, weak humans can be forgiven and not just forgiven, but enhanced and blessed and multiplied beyond what we were born as. What a gift. I was, I always like to take notes and listen, especially during the, the retelling of, of uh, Orland's life and others. And I get to hear these, these key events and changes in the path and, and someone got involved here that changed direction and he ended up going this way or ended up going that way. And, and that's fascinating to me. And then as I considered it, I thought what, how difficult it is to condense the life of Orlin or others to a couple of pages. And, and as I'm listening to, and all these stories are new to me, I haven't heard them before. I know many of you have, but I'm sure as he, as the stories were read and related that you were thinking of other things. Oh, I remember this, I remember that. And I hope that the spirit was filling your minds and your hearts with, with words he might've said songs he might have sung, decisions he might have made, examples that he showed uh, to you. I felt a little bit like, you know, how Mormon must have felt abridging the Book of Mormon, having these amazing records, tons of them. And his job was condense that down to one book, thousand years of history. And I was reminded of something that Nephi said, and he said this, 2 Nephi 33 says, and now I, Nephi, cannot write all the things which were taught among my people, neither am I mighty in writing like unto speaking. For when a man speaketh or sings or plays by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it into the hearts of the children of men. And I believe that's exactly what we have experienced today. We got a small abridgment of a wonderful long life, but hopefully you felt the power of the spirit carrying the meaning and the power of it into your hearts. I will add my testimony to that of, of Orlin Tilby. Jesus Christ lives he is our savior and redeemer. He is above all generous and kind and patient and forgiving and wants to help us so badly. That's all he wants to do is to help and bless us. 
and that particularly as we're about to celebrate his birth and advent, my prayer is that we remember how generous and loving and kind and patient he is. And we emulate that in our own families and for ourselves. I leave this testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll conclude with uh, closing hymn, Each Life That Touches Ours for Good, hymn number 293. Uh, the benediction will be offered then by Sister Carla Tanner. And then afterwards, if we could have the casket bearers um, gather in the foyer and the rest of us um, remain seated. That'd be great. Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the spirit that was felt here today. As we celebrate our loved one. We're so thankful for 
this gospel. And the things that were being taught us as a family, the importance of family, and to be there for other people. We ask the Spirit to dwell with us. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. 